Berlin, the capital of Germany, is a city with a complex history. Devastated and divided after World War II, the city was split in half by the Berlin Wall. Western Germany was formed by the Western Allies, America, Britain and France, and Eastern Germany was part of the Soviet sector. With this, there was West Berlin and East Berlin. Following German reunification in 1990, Berlin once again became the capital of all of Germany, and the two parts formed the whole. With such a famously terrible history, it's hard to believe that Berlin could also be the site of any theme park history. Yet nestled within the urban landscape is Spree Park Berlin, an abandoned amusement park that was once a beacon of joy and entertainment in the heart of East Germany. With the division in Germany, Geopolitical tension between the United States and the Soviet Union, along with their respective allies, the Western Bloc and Eastern Bloc, were high. Thus ensued the Cold War, as these two powers struggled for global influence. The main focus of this Cold War was of course the nuclear arms race, but the struggle for dominance was also expressed via less direct ways, including psychological warfare, propaganda, sports diplomacy, and technological competitions like the space race. As a part of all this, the German Democratic Republic, the governing body of East Germany, sought to create a symbol of socialist leisure and entertainment that would stand as a testament to their ideology. Thus, the idea for a theme park was born, and Kulter Park Plantewald eventually opened, later renamed to Spree Park due to its location by the Spree River. This park was to be a place where the allure of amusement was blended with the principles of socialist culture. Eastern Germany was typically closed off to any Western trade. However, an exception was made to allow the rides for this park to be imported from the West. The theme park officially opened in 1969, offering a variety of rides, attractions, and performances that hoped to captivate the hearts of Berliners and visitors alike. It was to serve as more than just an amusement park. It was to be a microcosm of East Germany's aspirations. The park was envisioned as a place where families could find solace from the pressures of daily life and where the shared joy transcended societal divisions. Its creation was a strategic move to showcase the German Democratic Republic's commitment to providing leisure opportunities for its citizens amid the backdrop of the East-West rivalry. Essentially, it was a large-scale propaganda operation. In its early years, the park was a success. Its iconic attractions, such as the Ferris wheel, the merry-go-round, and the giant slide, became beloved symbols of pride for Eastern Germany. It was a testament to the nation's ability to create moments of happiness during a time of turmoil. Ultimately, it was a symbol of socialist leisure, meant to embody the nation. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, Spree Park's allure only grew stronger. For the park, these were the golden years. Attractions evolved and expanded, a new roller coaster was added, along with other smaller attractions. Live performances, colourful parades, and theatrical shows showcased creativity and formed family memories to last a lifetime. The park's spinning top-shaped entrance became its symbol, and the sense of community flourished. Spree Park became a place where neighbours became friends, strangers shared laughter, making the park's cultural significance extend beyond its physical boundaries, weaving itself into the fabric of Berlin's collective memory. Even as the winds of political change began to blow, the park's vibrancy and spirit remained resilient. Spree Park continued to stand as a beacon of community, a testament to the enduring power of shared laughter and connection. On the 7th of October 1989, an upgraded version of the iconic Ferris wheel was unveiled to mark the 40th anniversary of the Socialist Republic, carrying 40 cabins and standing just over 40 metres tall. 
just over a month later, in November 1989, the Berlin Wall finally fell, marking a huge time of change for Germany. The reunification of the nation brought new opportunities and challenges. As East and West grappled to merge their distinct identities, Spree Park found itself at the crossroads of these transformations, navigating the uncertain waters of a united Germany. One of the key changes for Eastern Germany was the shift from a socialist economy to a market-oriented one. The economic challenges that emerged in the post-reunification era had a significant impact on Spree Park's operations. The park was privatised and there was a bid to buy it which was won by Norbert Witter in 1991. It is he who renamed the park Spree Park. Given his history of carnival operation, he was dubbed the King of Carousels and seemed perfect for this task. Although he did have a bit of a history with building accident-prone attractions, something he carried across to Spree Park when a crane accident killed seven people. At first, the family invested millions into the park, and it seemed to do well. They gradually transformed the park into the style of a western amusement park, converting the asphalt surface around the ferris wheel into a water landscape, adding a western town and an English village to the park. He also installed some new rides, which he bought from the closed Meropolis Amusement Park near Paris. With this, they stopped charging for individual attractions and added a park admission fee of 29 Deutsche Marks. However, maintaining the park's iconic attractions and organising elaborate performances became increasingly difficult in the face of financial constraints. Things took a major turn in 1997 when Witter and the city reached a leasehold agreement for the 74-acre site which stipulated that the owners would need to minimise the environmental impact of the park on the surrounding forest area. This made further expansion of the park near impossible, and also halted the construction of a much-needed parking lot. Without this, visitors were forced to park 15 minutes away or risk receiving a parking ticket. With this, Spree Park found itself caught in a web of economic challenges. As attendance dwindled, the financial strain was evident as maintenance costs increased and the park could not keep up. In order to try to combat this, in 1999, the park admission fee was up to 30 Deutsche Marks, but this only deterred people away. The park was struggling to keep up with the much wider range of entertainment options now available to the German public and just a short drive along the Autobahn away. Thus, the park's attractions, once symbols of Eastern Germany, began to show signs of wear and neglect, and the park's quality slowly declined. Another one of the main causes in loss of attendance was the post-reunification shift of Berlin's demographics. The reunification of the city led to a reshuffling of neighbourhoods, and the park's accessibility was affected as families moved to different parts of Berlin. The sense of community that had once been the foundation of Spree Park's success began to erode. While Spree Park had once been a symbol of unity, it now reflected the broader challenges faced by a unified Germany. The park's struggles mirrored the difficulties of merging two distinct systems and cultures, with economic pressures exposing the vulnerabilities that existed beneath the surface. By 2001, the park was in over 11 million euros of debt, and Witter declared bankruptcy. Following this, on the 18th of January 2002, Norbert Witter, together with his family and closest co-workers, moved to Lima, Peru. Here, he wished to open a new park called Luna Park, but the family's hopes for the future were dashed once again. The new park was a flop, and Mr. and Mrs. Vitter filed for divorce. Along with this, Vitter had shipped six attractions from Spree Park to Peru, having been allowed to do so by the authorities, who believed they were just being sent for repair. Unbeknownst to the police and Berliners, 
Vita had become involved in smuggling cocaine, concealing it in pieces of ride equipment shipped between Peru and Germany during his time as a park administrator. Vita was finally caught and was thus sentenced to seven years in jail for running a drug smuggling operation which had seemingly been going on for years. It is also suspected that the park was used by his family to launder drug money and was in fact much less successful than originally made to seem in the early years of their purchase. In October 2006, a Peruvian court sentenced Vita's son, Marcel Witt, to 20 years for drug smuggling. So it seems this operation was far from a one-off for the family. The closure of Spree Park was met with a mix of sadness and nostalgia. As the last visitors exited Spree Park, the once thriving amusement park descended into an eerie silence. The rides, which had once echoed with laughter and excitement, now stood still and motionless, with just the wind to rock their carriages. Nature began to reclaim the abandoned space and vegetation slowly overtook the decaying structures. Spree Park's abandonment transformed it into a time capsule, freezing a moment in history for all to see. Unsurprisingly, the site became rather popular with urban explorers. In 2008, a shocking turn occurred, and the park was actually given back to the Vita family, albeit just for guided tours and film productions. They even went on to open a snack bar named Mythos, another weird turn in these odd events. Thanks to this, between 2008 and 2014, it was the site of numerous large-scale cultural events, such as concerts, historical reenactments, and, at one point, a theatre project featuring the burning of a giant effigy. They also charged five euros for a tour of this abandoned space. Plus, the whole park was featured in the 2011 film Hannah and has also been used in some music videos. In 2014, the city of Berlin bought the park, following safety concerns spurred on by incidents of arson. Security strengthened and in 2016, the site was taken over by the company Grand Berlin, owned by the city, with the objective of transforming the site into a location for art and culture. Plans were proposed in late 2018, and since then, many of the attractions have been removed. In January 2021, the iconic Ferris wheel was finally removed. The plan is to incrementally renovate and eventually reopen the park as a nature and culture park by 2026, which is planned to be an environmentally friendly theme park, within which the Ferris wheel is set to be up and running again. Just a quick look at the current state of Spree Park makes it clear to see why urban explorers and photographers were drawn to its haunting allure and apocalypse-like landscape. The silent echoes of the past become a tangible presence here, inviting reflection on the passage of time and the impermanence of human creations. While Spree Park's gates may be closed, its legacy continues to resonate. The park's story is woven into the fabric of Berlin's history, reminding us of the complexities of societal change and the shifting sands of culture. Its presence, even in abandonment, serves as a reminder of the changing tides of politics, economics, and society. The park's transformation from a socialist leisure haven to an abandoned relic embodies the evolving narratives of the city and the nation. With the future plans in place, let's hope some development will finally return this park to a hub of the community. Thank you so much for watching. Please let me know some of your favorite stories regarding abandoned places. Also, please like, subscribe, and check out my links in the description.